The United States has long had a reputation for being a very innovative country, which among many inventions brought the world the mass-produced automobile thanks to Henry Ford's assembly line, the personal computer, the telephone, the light bulb and electricity, the smartphone, the digital camera, the airplane, as well as the global positioning system or GPS. Just to name a few of the wonderful inventions this country has produced. With all this in mind and said, one might become very confused when they find out that the best we can muster for high-speed rail service is on our northeast corridor from Boston to Washington, D.C., which contains only a few very brief segments in which trains can hit 150 miles per hour and only for very short periods in time, and only then if conditions allow. While other countries can easily stump up train services that run easily over 200 miles per hour on a consistent basis, as well as these services being available widespread, if not nationally, the next and understandable question that comes up, of course, is why is this? There are multiple reasons for this, and they include lack of foresight, including specifically lack of planning, the financial state of the railroad that constructed the Northeast Quarter, the Pennsylvania Railroad, and its counterpart, the New Haven Railroad, which would eventually become the Penn Central Railroad. But most notable of all these, politics. The U.S. rail line that would eventually be known as the Northeast Quarter would begin life in the late 1800s, when the Pennsylvania Railroad began to expand its territory to Washington, D.C., and eventually in the opposite direction back toward New York City. During this time, the company that is to say the Pennsylvania Railroad, found itself at odds with the reigning company that operated tracks between Baltimore and Washington called the B&O Railroad. The boundary-pushing tactics the Pennsylvania Railroad would eventually employ to get a line into Washington, D.C. would eventually set off a massive period of competition between the B&O and the Pennsylvania Railroad, with the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad eventually developing the Royal Blue Route to compete with the Northeast Quarter, for more information on just what happened here, feel free to check out my video on this topic. I'll post a link in the description. While the competition with the B&O certainly spurred development of the Northeast Quarter onward, again mainly due to in part how the Pennsylvania Railroad finally managed to get its trains into Washington, D.C., it was a notable innovation that was put in place on the northern end in New York City that would have a notable effect on as well as cause a huge difference between the trains the Pennsylvania Railroad ran between Washington, D.C. and New York City, as opposed to the trains that the Baltimore and Ohio ran between Washington, D.C. and New York City. And this is, to give it its formal name, electric traction. This is to say, trains being propelled by electricity. The rapid development of this new type of propulsion for trains was spurred on by a new ordinance in New York City that required all passenger trains entering the city to be, quote, smokeless. Regardless, the Pennsylvania Railroad would have been forced to develop this technology either way, as its new way of entering its new station being constructed in New York City was via tunnels that ran underneath the East River as well as Hudson River. This is obviously an area in which steam-propelled trains simply could not be allowed to operate due to the immense amounts of smoke and steam and lack of ventilation, which would most definitely cause the passengers and or crew to suffocate. While this project would end up costing the Pennsylvania Railroad over $50 million to complete, mind you, that's again an early 1900s cash, it would give the railroad a line that would actually allow them to access New York City directly with a station built on the actual premises. It should be noted that up until that point in time, all railroads, including the Pennsylvania Railroad, had to have their passengers detrain in New Jersey where they would take ferries across to New York City. However, what would prove to be an even bigger advantage for the Pennsylvania Railroad was the utilization of electric traction, as mentioned before, to propel the trains through the tunnels. Electric traction itself had its advantages, specifically the fact that it allowed trains to run at much higher speeds, with great ease, and compared to steam engine technology at the time, and even in later years, at a much lower cost for higher speeds. With trains operating at 100 miles per hour or closer to 100 miles per hour on a consistent basis. Not to mention the fact that these particular types of trains could accelerate much more rapidly than steam locomotives ever were capable of. Seeing the advantages in which electric traction had in terms of high-speed operations, and the fact that the Pennsylvania Railroad, like many other railroads at the time, was trying to increase the speeds of its passenger service to further attract new patrons and give the company bragging rights, 
As again, the Pennsylvania Railroad at that time was still the largest railroad in the United States, with its operating budget second to only that of the United States government itself. With all this in mind, the company began to electrify its line from New York City all the way down to Washington, D.C. Higher speeds plus the more direct route that the Pennsylvania Railroad's line took, plus the fact that the company had a direct line going into New York City and did not require its passengers to take a ferry across the Hudson River to New York City in New Jersey, as the B&O's Royal Blue Line did require at that time, gave the Pennsylvania Railroad's line a notable advantage over the Royal Blue Line. The other section that was part of what would eventually become the Northeast Corridor was owned by the New Haven Railroad. The New Haven Railroad also would begin to electrify its territory at this time to meet up with the line from New York City. Unfortunately, this project would come to a screeching halt just outside of New Haven, Connecticut, Due to some setbacks suffered by J.P. Morgan, the then owner of the New Haven Railroad, the total electrification from New Haven, Connecticut to Boston, Massachusetts not being completed for another 50 years. More on this later. While the competition for passengers running between New York City to Washington, D.C. and back would remain intense through to the end of World War II, as the 50s began with the rise of the interstate highway system as well as the airline industry, Things would begin to move in the opposite direction at an ever-rapid pace, eventually causing the B&O to get out of the passenger service between New York City and Washington, D.C. and completely discontinue its Royal Blue route. And with this lack of competition for New York City to Washington, D.C. and back passenger service, the Pennsylvania Railroad's line between Washington, D.C. and New York became largely stagnant in terms of its development. With this particular line's infrastructure still reflecting the time it was produced in the early 1900s, with some sections dating as far back as the late 1800s, with many twisty, turny sections such as the Elizabeth S curve, which to this day continues to cause slowdowns for trains running along this line, not to mention a severely outdated catenary system that was supplied by an equally outdated power system that was falling behind in its own capabilities in terms of maximum voltage, wattage, etc. With the continued and ever-increasing success of airlines, as well as the continued rise of the automobile, as well as an ever-increasing public opinion, though flawed, that suggested that railroads were always unprofitable because of their nature, as well as being outdated and seemingly incapable of turning a profit, and were essentially unnecessary to modern transportation in the United States. In short, unless something highly unanticipated took place, passenger rail transportation in the United States might very well go the way of the well and the bucket. And as it turns out, just such an event was about to take place on October 1st of 1964, when Shinkansen, or bullet train service, was inaugurated in Japan. These new electrically propelled trains could reach a top speed of 137 miles per hour and would drastically shorten rail trips in Japan. For example, the trip between Tokyo and Osaka which would originally have taken 6 hours and 40 minutes via a more conventional train, could now be done in a Shinkansen, or bullet train, in a mere 4 hours, shaving a noticeable nearly 3 hours off the actual travel time between the two cities and making rail travel between these two cities very practical. This began to cause an outcry in the United States as to, hey, why don't we have transportation like this? especially as the nation's over-reliance on air transportation began to take a noticeable toll on the infrastructure that was supporting it as it simply could not cope with the numbers coming through the gates, if you will. This would eventually turn the airline industry's reputation from being very glamorous in terms of its mode of transportation to very much tedious, with overcrowded airports and overbooked flights and other such issues that passengers had to contend with, as well as long delays due to the infrastructural challenges. A similar, if not worse, situation was breaking out on America's highways, with ever-increasing and more frequent traffic jams, safety issues, pollution issues, as well as higher fuel prices, not to mention a drastic increase in fatal car crashes, essentially pushing Americans off their roads and out of their cars. Ever-increasing public pressure for high-speed rail transportation within the United States would result in the High-Speed Ground Transportation Act of 1965. This would in turn lead to a joint development of a high-speed rail vehicle referred to as the Metroliner between the Pennsylvania Railroad, which would soon to become Penn Central, and the United States Department of Transportation. Unfortunately, this is as far as this act would go. No financial allowances and or plans were made to upgrade the infrastructure to allow trains to operate the proposed speeds approaching 150 miles per hour, easily beating that of the Shinkansen. As a result, this would make the goals of this act look more optimistic than practical.
This act would quickly be signed into law by the Johnson administration on September 30th, 1965. This is where things would start to go seriously wrong for this particular project. You see, the Johnson administration was now embroiled in a conflict in Vietnam, which had no clear victory conditions and was resulting in the drafting of several young Americans into the war effort, many of which would die in that war. The Johnson administration was also pursuing another act meant to solve most of the social issues plaguing the United States at that time, called the Great Society. And while it does appear very clear that this act had admirable goals, very clearly at least some part of it was to help distract the American people from the growing conflict in Vietnam, which was not going well at this point. The High Speed Ground Transportation Act would eventually be integrated into this particular act. Essentially, the signing of the 1965 High Speed Transportation Act into law was meant, at least in part, to distract the public from other failures of the Johnson administration. In short, politics were about to take control of, or at least play a significant part in the implementation of this particular act. And, and unfortunately so, like most projects that get this sort of treatment, the High Speed Transportation Act's ultimate goal would be forced off the rails, if you will. As the goalposts for this act would be moved so drastically in the end, it would achieve little of anything, and largely become a political vanity project. The then still in business Bud Company would get contracted to build the actual rail vehicles that would become the Metroliners, while the Westinghouse and GE firms would be contracted to handle the electronics, as well as propulsion systems for these self-propelled coaches. With the standard coach cars utilizing Westinghouse electronics and propulsion units, 20 of which would be built, and the snack car and parlor car coaches utilizing GE electronics, as well as GE propulsion systems, with 10 parlor cars and 20 snack cars being built from this order. From here on, this project would run into chronic and consistent issues, starting with the actual vehicles themselves, the Metroliners, which in part due to the Johnson administration's insistence upon meeting deadlines at all costs, were rushed through their production as well as development phases, leading to catastrophic failures and other issues. Most notably, the units that contain Westinghouse electronics and propulsion systems, as they put far too much strain on the aging catenary system that was in place from the early 1900s, and was not to be upgraded as part of this particular act, requiring that the electronics that propelled these particular coaches be overhauled, including the transformer design, and several changes made to the power supply for the catenary, including the upgrading and replacement of substations along the line. Other issues with the Bud-built Metroliners included overheating when stopping frequently at stations, and the failure of the dynamic braking systems due to snow ingestion due to the fact that they were initially placed underneath the bodies of these coaches. Then there was the elephant in the room, the infrastructure that no one seemed to think needed to be upgraded, with some sections of this infrastructure dating back to the late 1800s and having the same era signaling systems, not to mention excessive curved sections, which is a product of the way railroads were constructed at the time, not to mention the aging catenary system, which again could trace its heritage back to the early 1900s, which would cause the pantographs, which are used to collect power from these wires and transport them to the actual trains themselves, to actually bounce as they moved along. This most commonly occurred on the units with the Westinghouse propulsion systems and electronics, causing rapid and sudden power drops leading to unstable, not to mention uncomfortable running for these coaches. Not to mention notable power fluctuations on the Northeast Corridor. Making the proposed high speeds the self-propelled Metroliners were supposed to reach, again approaching 150 miles per hour, all the more difficult to achieve, and seemingly more optimistic than anything else. Then there was the Pennsylvania Railroad who would become the Penn Central Railroad by the time these cars were finally put in service in 1969. The once highly successful and prosperous company was now on a long slide into oblivion. Therefore, things like track maintenance began to slowly but surely slip meaning that the outdated architecture of the Northeast Corridor wasn't even kept to its highest possible standards, further aggravating the situation for getting these trains up to their speeds. In the end, due to all the before-mentioned issues, plus another extreme issue, where when these coaches were to pass aging rolling stock running in the opposite direction and literally knocking the windows out on this rolling stock, the FRA would limit these particular self-propelled units to 110 miles per hour, only slightly quicker than the then 100 miles per hour that the GG1s long considered the speed demons of the Northeast Corridor, and aging rolling stock usually hit. Unfortunately, due to deferred maintenance on both the tracks and equipment operating at that time, speeds had actually been dropped to 90 miles per hour for many sections of the rail line at that time.
As a result of all of this, these trains would be initially limited to a top speed of just 100 miles per hour while in Northeast Corridor service. After several delays, plus a legal settlement with the Bud Company, the now Penn Central Railroad would finally introduce Metroliner's service on January 16th of 1969. Upon entry into service, these units proved anything but reliable, with out-of-service rates approaching 50%. Not to mention some initial issues with the Westinghouse-based units having a hard time even making acceleration rates comparable to that of the currently existing self-propelled coaches on the Northeast Corridor. Yet despite this and all the other issues the Metroliner sets had run into before they had been introduced into service, not to mention additional and recurring problems that would cause these units to have to undergo rebuilding far earlier than they were supposed to have been, they were in fact a rousing success. The success of the Metroliners had nothing to do with them actually making the speed specifications they were originally targeted to, which again was a politically motivated charge being pushed on by the Johnson administration and one specification that the administration would be forced to abandon as there was simply no way of making it happen between the issues with the actual Metroliners themselves and the infrastructure they operated on. Rather, this was due to other factors such as clever marketing, these particular train sets' unique look, especially compared to the aging GG1s and prehistoric rail stock, which all Northeast Quarter trains were composed of up until that point. And there was also the fact that while these sets did fail to meet their targets of 150 miles per hour, at 110 miles per hour, they were still the fastest rail vehicles in the United States at that time, giving New York to Washington, D.C. service a noticeable boost. Although they would be permanently limited in operating service to 100 miles per hour, and only then in areas in which track conditions would allow. The other factor in the success of the Metro Liners was a growing number of business travelers traveling to and from Washington, D.C. that were growing ever more fed up with overcrowded airports, overbooked and canceled flights, and other such delays causing massive issues in traveling from New York to Washington, D.C. and back. As well as ever-increasing issues driving between New York and Washington, D.C. and destinations along that route, with ever-increasing traffic jams, accidents, and higher fuel prices playing a huge role here. But the true success point for the Metro Liners did not come until 1971, when the National Railway Passenger Association, or Amtrak, assumed control of all of the United States passenger trains, including ownership of the Northeast Corridor. But the Northeast Corridor successfully saved from the clutches of the now bankrupt Penn Central Railroad, Amtrak began to undertake maintenance projects to get the tracks up to at least that of the standard they were made to, as well as some minimal upgrades. This would allow the Metroliners, whose top speed due to track conditions as well as maintenance issues on them, was forcibly reduced to 90 miles per hour, to be brought back up to a maximum in-service speed of 100 miles per hour, especially after they went through a major rebuild program. This modest increase actually helped Amtrak a lot as it was able to get trip times between New York and Washington, D.C. down to three hours flat with, of course, a limited stop schedule. During the major upgrade that occurred on the Metroliners, which took them down for an extended period in the early 80s, Amtrak would pick up a lot of valuable knowledge as to how to maintain the Metroliner schedule, and in this case, without actually utilizing Metroliners. Amtrak found that by modestly rebuilding and regearing a select group of eight GG1 Electrics who again had their origins way back in the early 1930s, they could come close to, if not match, the schedule of the Metroliners. This in turn might have a noticeable effect on Amtrak's future motive power as well as coach purchases for the Northeast Quarter. Another much needed and very helpful shot in the arm came from the 1973 oil crisis, which made driving and flying notably more expensive. Because of where Amtrak got its power from and because of the general efficiency of trains, the fuel crisis had far less of an effect on Amtrak, allowing it to just maintain ticket prices with only modest increases, especially compared with the airlines who were suffering greatly due to drastic increases in fuel prices, forcing their ticket prices up notably. The Metroliners would remain in service for years more. Unfortunately, reliability issues would continue to pile up on these units, despite being rebuilt. While the Metroliner itself could technically be considered a flop, Amtrak would in fact make some gains from this project, specifically a new type of coach design, which would become the Amfleet, which was largely derived from the Metroliner. Amtrak being inspired to make this choice when it observed how comfortable these coaches rode at the higher speeds, as well as how easy they were to get up to higher speeds, as opposed to more traditional rolling stock the company already owned. This was thanks to the way the Metroliner had been designed for extreme lightweight as well as comfort and speed. 
The next notable speed increase, but still far short of targets, was when the AEM-7s were introduced. This would prove a much-needed fleet upgrade for Amtrak, as the aging GG1s were starting to really show their ages despite being rebuilt, and the unreliable GE-built E60s were not capable of maintaining speed specifications due to a problem with yaw or side swing when running in excess of 100 miles per hour due to a bad truck design that was based upon a freight locomotive. These double-cabbed electric locomotives were based upon the popular Swedish RC series of locomotives and were easily capable with some minor upgrades to the still outdated infrastructure to the Northeast Corridor of reaching speeds of 125 miles per hour on a regular basis. Now, one might think by this point with all these increases in Metroliner and Northeast Quarter speeds alike, which all took place in the very late 80s and very early 90s, that in fact the Northeast Quarter was beginning to catch up with Japan. Well, actually no. You see, the Shinkansen wasn't standing still either, and by this point could easily exceed 150 miles per hour, incidentally the proposed top speed at one point of the Metroliner, and was now in some cases able to reach 180 miles per hour, and would soon top 200 miles per hour in some sections. In short, high-speed rail passenger transportation was a moving target, and Amtrak was falling further and further out of range of it, despite a few notable speed increases on Northeast Corridor trains. With the exception of some minor upgrades to the infrastructure of the Northeast Corridor, such as the signals which were originally three-position amber lights, being replaced by color-coded position signals, red, yellow, and green, Northeast Quarter service speed remains somewhat stagnant, with tight budgets blocking many infrastructural projects required to increase speeds from taking place until some time in the late 90s. The only real exception to this was the testing of several high-speed train sets from different countries, including Germany's ICE train, or ICE train, short for Inner City Express, and Sweden's famous X2000, designed to tilt through very tight turns. The X2000 itself proved the most successful of the two trains, as these tilting train sets were able to tilt their way through curves, allowing the said trains to negotiate turns at much higher speeds than the conventional train sets were capable of, although this was not applied to all sections of Amtrak's Northeast Corridor. One notable exception is the Elizabeth S curve, which remains a bottleneck to this day. The basic concepts from the X2000 tilting train cars, etc., became the basis for what would eventually be known as the Acela set. With Alstom, the company responsible for manufacturing the French TGV sets, being contracted to build the power cars slash locomotives for the service, with the coaches slash passenger cars being semi-permanently attached, being produced by Bombardier, and those of you Canadian rail fans out there which note that these cars from the SL look at least somewhat familiar, you're right. They are in fact actually based upon the LRC cars using the famous Canadian LRC train sets, employing their tilt train technology. These said train sets would be capable of 150 miles per hour. And please note the term capable as this will come in later on. The project, which was originally known as the American Flyer Project, was unveiled in 1999. Along with, some interestingly enough, and excitingly enough, improvements to the actual infrastructure of the Northeast Quarter, such as the North End Electrification Project, which essentially was for the electrification of the still unelectrified section of the Northeast Quarter between New Haven, Connecticut and Boston, Massachusetts. In addition to this improvement, and to further increase safety on this particular part of the corridor, the railroad crossings that still existed in this area would either be upgraded or completely removed altogether, allowing for safe operations at 100 miles per hour plus to complement the new trains. While it seemed that this plan had plenty of potential and was creating quite a bit of buzz and excitement as the United States would finally at least start to catch up with Japan, whose bullet trains now average closer to 200 miles per hour, once again, much like all the other attempts to speed the Northeast Corridor trains up, it was riddled with faults. The most notable was the infrastructure. Yes, it was going to get upgraded under this plan in a few ways here and there, but not enough to really make much of a difference. Remember what I said about the Acela train sets being capable of 150 miles per hour before? Well, that was the point. They could do 150 miles per hour, but most sections of the Northeast Quarter would not support this speed, especially the new section between Boston and New Haven, Connecticut. This particular section was very curvy, and while there were one or two places within it that could in fact permit 150 mile per hour operations, these are very brief. 
Amtrak would eventually add a few more 150 mile per hour sections between Washington DC and New York. However, these were only brief sections and were not major sections of the line and would not have much of an effect on the average speeds or trip times of the Acela train sets. The biggest effect, ironically enough, from all these infrastructural improvements was simply the fact that a train would not have to change locomotives at New Haven, Connecticut to reach Boston, Massachusetts, saving it noticeable time. In short, and unfortunately so, the Acela train sets to this day are only capable of a slightly higher, if that much, average speed than the Northeast regionals and only under certain conditions. And all of this together is what doomed this project to fail before it even had gotten started. In terms of speeding up trains and getting them to Japanese and or European country standards. That said, the Acela was actually a success in terms of its marketing ability, in terms of attracting new riders to the rails, especially with the increased demand for train trips by millennials, who prefer to take trains for long trips rather than drive their cars. The reason why, for example, the bullet trainer Shinkansen is able to make the speeds it does is that it runs on a dedicated right-of-way or rail line that is all high speed. No slow speed trains operate on it. While in the United States there is no such thing, the Northeast Corridor tracks are still shared with slower commuter trains as well as in some cases freight trains. The end result, it is very difficult to obtain those higher speeds. So even the 150 mile per hour sections aren't even a guaranteed 150 mile per hour run. And while curve speed was improved, this hasn't really affected the average in speeds thanks to more congestion on the Northeast Corridor. In short, Amtrak's Acela train sets are really nothing more than Porsche 911s being forced to run on regular unleaded, never being able to show their true potential. And while they do have the potential of reaching 150 miles per hour, there just aren't enough sections on the Northeast Corridor for this to make much of a difference. Essentially, despite all the money spent on the project and the fact that these trains are featured tilting technologies and 150 mile per hour capabilities, the average speed remains very much comparable to a standard Northeast regional set which still tows the aging AM fleets being propelled by Siemens electric locomotives. With all of this in mind, one might ask as to how the Acela manages to somehow be faster for trips between Boston, Massachusetts and Washington, D.C. if the speeds are comparable, and it's really quite simple. They're not. How Amtrak keeps the travel times down compared to the regional train sets is really quite simple. It kneecaps, if you will, the Northeast Regional Service trains so that they cannot run at full speed, giving the Acela trains priority at every chance. So, for example, if one is on a Northeast Regional set and an Acela set needs to get ahead of it, it's going to be put in the hold and or in a siding and or be held in a station so that the Acela set can take the lead and get ahead. The Regional sets also have to make many more stops in route compared to the Acelas, which run express service through. In short, and it's painful for me to say this, the Acela is essentially like one of those 1-800 ads you see on TV. Advertising a product that's being promoted to be much better than it actually is, in hopes that you'll stump up the cash to pay for whatever overpriced item is being sold, only to be disappointed once said product arrives in the mail. The next attempt to increase speeds on the Northeast Corridor brings us to current times, as it began in 2016, with a $2.4 billion loan approved for Amtrak to acquire 28 new high-speed train sets built by Alstom, the same company that produced the power cars for the current Acela sets, except in this case the cars will also be produced by Alstom. These new sets will be capable of reaching 165 miles per hour and will be replacing the current 20 Acela sets, 16 of which are currently in service. While the plan for this most recent attempt to increase speed sounds extremely encouraging, it became very clear very early on that it was riddled with faults. And once again, the usual suspects were at fault. To start with, Alstom, instead of selling Amtrak a well-proven version of the TGV that had been out for a while, now sold them the most recent development of the TGV technology, which was not even in production when the contract was signed to purchase these units and have them constructed for Amtrak, as well as maintained by Alstom for Amtrak. In fact, the Avalia Liberty sets were so new that the design had not even been finalized when they were actually put into production which would lead to inevitable teething problems during testing, which would begin in February of 2020. At the United States Transportation and Technology Center located in Pueblo in the state of Colorado, the first of the Avalia Liberty sets to test on the Northeast Corridor occurred in May 2020, 
with the first run being run up to Boston, Massachusetts South Station on September the 28th, 2020. Needless to say, problems were detected with these units, which is typical for any new piece of technology, but others were specific to the Northeast Corridor. For example, there were issues with the pantographs being unstable at higher speeds down the Northeast Corridor. This was solved by attaching a wing to the actual panto to keep it stabilized at speed. Despite all of this, it looked like the train sets would make their debut sometime in 2022, as they were scheduled for. Unfortunately, out of nowhere, suddenly all of these units got pulled from testing and parked at Amtrak's 30th Street station in Philadelphia's yard. Initially, it was reported that testing had stopped, and apparently this is also still the case to a certain extent, due to Alstom not having sufficient computer models to test these train sets at speeds down the Northeast Corridor. It appears now, however, that this issue has finally been taken care of. As disclosed by Amtrak officials on Friday the 12th of January 2024, these train sets finally passed the computer modeling tests after several failed attempts. It was then reported that there were issues with the trains operating at high speeds. Essentially, once again, the problem was that the Northeast Corridor was simply incapable of supporting these sorts of operations due to its woefully outdated infrastructure. In short, if the Acela was the equivalent of a Porsche being forced to run on regular octane gas, that being, of course, the Northeast Corridor, the Avalia Liberty sets are essentially Porsches that are incapable of running on regular octane gas and must have high test, which the Northeast Corridor is not the equivalent of. This appears to once again come back to the lack of foresight and the fact that politics played a huge role in this whole project. With politicians being involved, if not directly responsible for making decisions, and or people who are actually trained to handle projects like this, being forced to make decisions based upon vanity and politics, and not upon practicality. In short, and it appears that this is what took place. Like anyone who makes a purchase without doing proper research, mistakes are bound to happen. In this case, essentially the politicians fell in love with the 165 mile per hour capabilities of these train sets on the Northeast Corridor without having the concept of the fact that the tracks had to support these speeds in order for them to be possible, assuming that the new Avalia Liberty train sets would magically speed everything up all by themselves. As of Friday the 12th, 2024, it appears that the Avalia Liberty train sets will be limited to a maximum speed of 160 miles per hour, according to statements made by the FRA. Again, this has still not been finalized as of this time. Currently, the still undelivered Avalia Liberty sets continue to languish in Philadelphia's 30th Street Station yard. With the computer modeling tests finally passed, what appears to be holding the sets up now has to do with their cornering abilities. Again, much like their predecessors, these sets are designed to lean into curves to allow them to take turns at higher speeds. As of the making of this video, testing is underway to test these sets in curves to see how they will perform. As mentioned before, due to the FRA testing, it appears that these sets are currently going to be limited to 160 miles per hour. Again, this has not been finalized. And while again this is not clear, it appears that the speed will only be achieved on certain sections of the Northeast Corridor. There are apparently new projects underway to speed up the Northeast Corridor so that these trains can reach their planned speeds and operate reliably so. It's not clear as to how this is going to be achieved as none of the right-of-way again on the Northeast Corridor is dedicated to high-speed operations with even the Center Express high-speed tracks seeing use by lower-speed commuter trains. There's also the unfortunate fact that every attempt in the past to drastically improve the infrastructure on the Northeast Corridor to permit such high-speed operations has ended in failure due to, again, lack of planning and staggeringly high price tags. And with those involved, political and otherwise, all agreeing that high-speed service should definitely be improved on the Northeast Corridor, and that being as far as the discussion goes. In short, and I hope this is not the case, it appears that the Avalia Liberty project is more of the same. Where again, a very big politically motivated and or vanity motivated project is set up to increase speeds on the Northeast Corridor, and having those speeds reduced to the point where essentially almost nothing is achieved, with the end result having the project's goal being reduced to the project simply being completed for the sake of being completed, regardless of whether it actually achieves anything. New estimates are for the Avalia Liberty sets to start service at the halfway point of 2024. It's not clear as to how this is going to happen. It should also be noted that supposedly these sets haven't actually been accepted as officially being delivered to Amtrak at this time due to contractual issues with their production from Alstom. While it's my sincere hope that I have reached this conclusion in error, my confidence that this being the case is not great, especially considering past results.
And that's going to do it for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If not, thumbs down. Please like and subscribe. And again, thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep the metal side down.